spring day. I don't know what kind of spring this is, but uh, welcome to our service this morning, those online and those who are here. It's nice to have you uh, with us, and it's nice to have others uh, tuning in with us. And uh, yeah, so welcome to our service this morning. I uh, pray for us, and then I want to read for us, and ask that the Lord will bless our time together. And I want to read to you from Romans 8 as a start of our, of our call to worship this morning. Let's uh, pray. Let's commit our time to the Lord in, in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you today, Lord, for the work that you have done in our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you have done on the cross that has made it possible for us to be called your children. We are no longer uh, strangers to you, no longer aliens, no longer foreigners to you, Lord God. No longer enemies of God, but we are your family, Lord. We thank you for bringing us in and uh, for forgiving us of our sins and for making a way for us to be known by you, Lord God, to, to know you uh, personally as our Lord and Saviour. We commit this time to you, Lord. We pray, Lord God, for your blessing upon this time and upon each person, Lord, and taking part in one way or another in the service. We ask, Lord God, that indeed you would do your good work in each of our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 8, you will... Uh, Romans 8 is a, a very well-known passage uh, that's certainly a favourite for many you can have uh, favorites in the Bible, but it certainly is uh, such a powerful uh, encouragement to us as believers, where it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life and sets you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What an encouragement that is to us today. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We often feel a sense of condemnation. We often will uh, carry a burden of our, of our guilt and our sin. But this passage reminds us of the complete forgiveness that God offers to us and the hope that we have, that there is no condemnation. In the Middle Eastern culture, uh, they, they talk about a shame culture uh, where this idea of being shamed and, and condemned is very real, very uh, 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 it's a very powerful uh, passage of scripture uh, in such a context that even in our own, perhaps where uh, we have a sense of, of guilt, uh, we have complete forgiveness in Christ, we are reminded of here. And of new life, as it says, because he has given us this new life. Not a life that we live on our own, but a life that is lived by the Spirit of God, who has set us free because we live by the law now, we live by the Spirit, no longer by the law. We've been set free from that. And so we have new life in Christ through His Holy Spirit that He has given us. And this is a great encouragement to us. And uh, I think a wonderful call to worship this morning because it gives us a reason why we are here, why we worship God, why we give thanks to God because of all that God has done for us in His Son, uh, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come and lead us in some song and some uh, praise and worship as uh, as we sing together and uh, you can remain seated uh, where you are and uh, as the worship team leads us thank you
attention to you if you didn't get the message with the different digests in uh, next uh, Sunday. As you know, we've gone down at midnight tonight, we'll go down to level one, which means we can go up to 100 people. And uh, I know a few folks that said they're going to start coming from, from next week. Uh, you will obviously have to still wear a mask, things like that. The safety uh, measures will still be in place, and um, but you'll be able to have uh, more people as such. In our, in our services, but directly after the service, for members, we're going to be having a, uh, hopefully a short uh, a meeting, a special general meeting. I'll be sending out the details in the week, just so you know what the agenda is and, and the minutes and all the rest for us. Uh, but it's been a long time since we've had a, a proper come down and sit together a general meeting, so uh, please just remain after the service. We'll have a, 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 a general meeting, a special general meeting, just to discuss some some issues that we need to, to resolve. And there is still no evening service, in case you're wondering about that. So once uh, 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 we have the level uh, 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 one, and once the numbers increase sufficiently in the morning, we can uh, consider other services, but for now we just have the one service in the, in the day. And then Peter wants to just share something. Peter wants to just give a testimony, and uh, you know, come, come up front here, Peter, so people can see you. Uh, this is Peter Mabutula and his lovely wife Ellen, and uh, they recently got married. Uh, yeah, Peter, you just have to speak up loud. Uh, I want to thank you both for giving me my wife, and uh, I want to, um, to thank also Kevin for understanding me. Thank my wife on this lockdown. I come to Kevin, I go to Kevin's house. I speak to him, say I find a girlfriend in Westway. So I want to, before I, I stay with my girlfriend, I want you to bless us. So Kevin told me, okay, you're supposed to bring your girlfriend. In the office, at the office. So I bring my daughter there, so Kevin will speak to her. So make a, a date and Kevin will bless her. Maybe you just hear a message, say, Peter, find a girlfriend, go to bed. So I want to thank Kevin for understanding me and. Uh, for also what he done to me Bef before I start work. The first time I come to this church, Kevin helped me a lot. So me alone, I stand here to thank Kevin and your family, God bless you. Okay. And all the people from this church, when this lockdown, you helped me a lot. So I want to thank you for that. And also my wife, she also encouraged me when I was so I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pray for a few uh, things that we need to be praying for, praying them before God. Uh, Hunter ends as he continues his treatments. Uh, we will just continue praying for Hunter. I've been praying for him for a long time. And we just continue to do so. He hasn't been well. He's still going for, for uh, chemotherapy. And, um, and we just want to lift the, the Ems family up to the Lord. Uh, many of you will still remember uh, Glenn and Jeannie Stavridis. Uh, Glenn was an elder in this church. Before I came to the church, he was one of the elders in the church. And um, so many of you remember him. Those of you who have been around for a little while. Uh, they have a little granddaughter called Abiba, and Abiba is four years old. She has leukemia, and uh, she's going to speak for very intensive chemotherapy. The last time that she went through this intensive chemotherapy, it's a week-long treatment, and um, I think she permanently administered the, the chemotherapy, and last time she reacted quite poorly. So we just want to commit uh, the Stavridis family and uh, their little granddaughter, Abiba, uh, in our prayers. I mean, many of you know uh, uh, Roslyn and Isaac Fredericks. Uh, they were here last week sitting right at the back there. 
Uh, they, their daughter, Reva, recently had a baby, and there's been some complications. She had to have an operation, and now she's having to have a second operation, and so she's really not well. She contracted corona in the process, and uh, so she has really been unwell. So we just want to pray for, uh, for Reva and for uh, the Fredericks family. And then some good news, Nathan and Emily are expecting child. Uh, it won't be here in time for Christmas, but uh, in April they're expecting. So congratulations to Nathan and Emily. Uh, uh, adding to their number, uh, adding to the church's number, we just pray for Emily as, as she uh, carries the child for the next uh, few uh, months. Deline, who has broken her leg last week, uh, has been had an operation. She's doing very well. Uh, she's progressing along nicely. They've moved her from Victoria Hospital to the Booth Memorial Hospital. Uh, but she's, uh, she's making some good progress there, so we'll just continue to pray for her. We also had some good news this week with Alistair Turvey, who, you know, he's been having heart troubles uh, of late. During lockdown, he had these heart troubles. And uh, uh, he went for tests this week and all kinds of heart tests, and the doctors are very happy with his progress, so they have seen a remarkable improvement, so we just thank the Lord for his mercies uh, there. And then of course we'll pray for our country, and the many challenges that we face, and also pray for our church, and uh, for Alec as well, who's not feeling well today. Is there anybody else, any other prayer items you can remember this morning? Yes.
day of good recovery and for Alistair, the good news that we have heard from him. And Lord, likewise, we pray for Beth and ask of God that she is really struggling with her health at the moment, that you that would have a take on her, that you would encourage her and strengthen her. Lord, thank you for Cyril and Ted who help her, and ask, we ask of God that you would strengthen her once again. And hopefully even one day we'll be able to see her again back at the chapel and be able to worship together with her once again. We do uh, pray for your Alan Quince as well, and for uh, him not feeling well today, we commit him to you as we do also just pray for Shirley. Uh, once again, we've heard that's not doing well and is waiting more treatment. So we commit her to you and ask for a remarkable recovery of all these uh, various people who are going through the difficulties. They are a constant reminder, Lord, that we live in a broken world and a fallen world where things are not as they ought to be we we are in need of a saviour, in need of a, of hope, and in need of of your hand of blessing, Lord. We think of our country, Lord, and the many challenges that we face in our land. And we want to pray for our leaders. We want to pray in the, the fight against uh, corruption and the, the fight against uh, the many uh, issues of unemployment and uh, service delivery. Uh, the many things, Lord, that we daily hear about in the news, Lord. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray for integrity. And Lord, that you give them the strength and ability uh, to do uh, what they have been appointed to do, Lord. We do pray for our church, Lord, as we are gradually opening things up, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, for this new season in the life of the church, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on us, Lord, that we would be, Lord, at your service, Lord, doing your good will in all that we do. Thank you, Lord God, for each one here. Lord, you know the many needs, the many challenges, Lord, the many blessings. We thank you for Peter and Helen, and as Peter has just shared a short testimony today, Lord, and what a blessing, Lord, his experience in his life with, the, with this new wife, Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you would undertake for them and bless them marriage, Lord. Thank you for each one here, and Lord, as we uh, approach your, your throne, Lord God, as we come to your word, we ask, Lord God, that you speak to us and bless us now in Jesus' name. Worship team, God, one, two, one, 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 one for us. And uh, let's stand because I know sitting for a long time is, is very tricky. So let's stand together and ask uh, uh, God to, uh, to come and to speak to us and to bless us as we approach His word. <laughs>
way, Lord, into your world for our lives, Lord. Strengthen us in the faith, and encourage us in the path of the day, Lord, and help us, Lord, to bring honor and glory to you as we hear your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to start by reading this morning from verse 8. We continue our series in the letter of 1 John, chapter 1, and verse 8. The title of this morning's message is Christ our Defender. It says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. I'm going to read. That Father, this morning, praise God for His Word and may His Word speak into our lives. Some of you may have had a run in with the law. I won't ask you to show your hands. I uh, hope not too many of us have had the experience of being accused of something uh, criminally. Uh, some of you may have had this experience with the law. Uh, you may have been accused of something and had to go to court uh, to face the charges. Whether you are innocent or not, because you know everyone in jail is innocent according to uh, to themselves. Whether you are innocent or not, or whether that person is innocent or not, is a very daunting experience. The police, the the prosecutors, are not very forthcoming with any evidence, with any information that they have. Uh, they purposefully withhold information from you because they want convictions. And it's not their job to help you. It's not their job to acquit you or to defend you. That's your lawyer's job. Uh, it is a tactical move on their part to not give you information in case if, 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 so that you might incriminate yourself, that you might know something that an innocent person wouldn't know. And by disclosing that information or saying something, uh, they catch you in the process. Now, of course, the stakes are very high. Going to court. Uh, facing such charges, the stakes are generally very high, and the process is very slow, it's very drawn out, it's very cold and very procedural, and uh, the whole judicial process and mechanism is, is, is very intimidating and frightening, a frightening experience uh, being in such a situation. So I encourage you, don't get yourself in that situation in the first place. Not that I have been there, myself personally, I can happily say, uh, so far so good, as they say, but uh, I've been with people who have been arrested and have faced charges, and uh, it is a very frightening experience. You're at the mercy of others, and even if you're innocent, and even if you have a good case, uh, uh, even if uh, uh, you're not guilty, uh, or you know that they have a good case against you, or that you are guilty, uh, it is still a very frightening experience. Uh, and people will do everything they can, of course, to get off the charges, to have the charges dropped, or to have a very light sentence. That's everyone's hope. Uh, in the morning when the police van rides past, you can hear the prisoners in the back making a lot of noise, so shouting and making all kinds of noise. When they come back in the afternoon, it's even noisier. There's almost like a, a tension. Because the other ones that didn't get off, and uh, they came back to their residence. And uh, it is a very uh, frightening thing to have to go through. And so you need the best lawyer you can find. People who have been accused of something bad generally go into a fight or a flight mode, a runaway mode or a fight mode. Uh, they try to run from the threat or they try to fight the threat. And the classic response to fighting is, of course, denial. That's what we see here in our passage this morning. It's a denial of, of self that we first see. That's the first point. Verses 8 and 9. It says, if we claim to be without sin, it's denying sin within us. It's the first uh, mode that we protect ourselves, the first defense mechanism that we, that we resort to is a denial of self. Uh, you might plead not guilty. Uh, you might plead on the basis of who you are. You know, people say things like, I would never do such a thing like that. 
And that's a denial of self. You would do such a thing like that. Never say you would never do such a thing like that because under the right set of circumstances, you probably would do such a thing like that. But this is saying, you know, I'm an honest person. I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm kind. Uh, and so this really addresses the heart issue. You might be all those things, good and kind, but the charge that's brought against you is not about your goodness or your kindness. It's about who you are as an individual and what you've done and what you have done. We think and we know that we say things like, you know, I'm not a bad person. So why would I do such a thing? Or people will say, he's such a nice person. Some of you, as parents, you, you have children who have done all kinds of things, and you'll we'll talk together and you'll say, he's not a bad person, even though he's done very bad things. Of course, you must ask, well, why is he doing the bad things if he's not such a bad a person? The reality is, we cannot deny the sin that lives within us. It says, if we claim to be without sin, that is a sin within us, we are not walking in the truth. You see, John is dealing first and foremost with the heart nature issue. The issue within. It's that you are by nature a sinner. It's that you are by nature, we are fallen, a broken people. You might do good things and you might be a very kind person. I'm sure you are a very kind person in many ways. But deep within us, there still remains a don't have an issue. If you're a kind person, doesn't make mean you don't have an issue in other ways. Just because you don't display the symptoms all the time, it doesn't mean that you're not infected with a disease or a virus, as we know. Many are asymptomatic in the in the sinful natures. You might have had a very good upbringing. Uh, your parents might have taught you very well right from wrong. Uh, you know how to toe the line. You know how to behave appropriately. Uh, to behave in socially acceptable ways, but that does not cure us of the inner turmoil within us. Even if we are very good on, in an outward display, and the way that we display ourselves, we still feel anger within, don't we? We still feel, in our private thoughts, we still have all kinds of struggles. We have fantasies in our minds. We think if anybody knew what goes on in the head, uh, what goes on in the heart, we would be disgraced. We have struggles within us. We battle with lust and with greed and with despair, where we lose sight of God, uh, of hopelessness and faithlessness. This is a common struggle to us all. And when we feel that, when we realize that, when we see that inner turmoil that we're in, it reminds us that we are sinners by nature. You see, you might be able to fool others. You might be able to deceive them about your true nature. But by, uh, right, by the right things that you say and, and by your good behavior, but if you start believing for a minute that you're okay because others think that you are okay, because others might say you're such a good guy, you're such a nice person, and people might even affirm you in that say you're such a good person. But remember, it's a faulty measure. If we measure ourselves, or even if we allow others to measure us. It's like using a broken ruler to measure if your ruler is straight, if your ruler is okay. You don't use something that's broken to measure if something else is fixed. Now, if you, even if it's just to yourself that you are without sin, that there is nothing faulty within, as John tells us, you're deceiving yourself, and this is a grave danger. Even we know it's more difficult to deceive ourselves. But if we deny and say that there is no sin in us, we are deceiving ourselves. As we deceive ourselves into believing that we are without sin, we are in very dangerous territory. And because you know, you will never deceive God. Amen. Your verdict is not in line with God's truth and God's verdict that has been brought down upon us. And therefore, the truth is not in us. God is true. He is perfect. We are not. And we cannot judge ourselves. As others cannot judge us either. It's what we call hypocrisy. It comes from the, 
the theatre acting, you know, where actors will, will wear different clothing and makeup and other hairstyles. They used to even wear masks to, to mask who they really are, but you're still the same person. I was given this very nice mask by my mother-in-law, and it actually gets quite, a, quite an emotion from people, the big uh, smiley face. And uh, wherever I go, I see people smiling at me, and like, it's almost like I know them. And then I realize I'm actually smiling at my, at my mask, and, and my mask is smiling, it brings a smile to other people. But behind the mask, I could be, well, I could be pulling a tongue at them, I could, be, uh, I could be very miserable behind the mask. I'm still the same person behind the mask. And John is telling us that we, that we are, that, that, that if we deceive ourselves into thinking that within us there is not a problem, we are deceiving ourselves. And this is where we must see our first problem. Our first and foremost problem is within us. That's where it always starts. You see, you're not the victim in your story. You're not the, the victim here. You are the perpetrator. And until we recognize our problems lie within us, first and foremost, within ourselves, and not with others, and not with our circumstances, we will never really get to the bottom of our heart issues. But when you do, you will receive the breakthrough that you need. And this is the hope that is promised. You're faced with a choice. It's really a, a fork in the road. And there's two different outcomes. And you're faced with this, with this choice. Each option is marked with the word if. If we say this, then that's the outcome. But if we say that, there's a very different outcome. Think of it as if you, if you go left and you live in the denial of sin within, it leads you to being deceived by none other than yourself and separated from God's truth and God's truth is not within you. But if you turn to the right, um, and if you, if you turn the right way, as he says, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge that there is a problem within us, then we can begin to experience the healing in our hearts that God can only do. Now why is confession necessary? Because that's how if we confess our sins, we need to just consider Moment. It's not going into a little booth with a priest. That's not what is in my chair at all. Uh, why is confession necessary? Well, it is our first act of faith when we come to believe in Jesus Christ by believing His Word about us. We confess our sins to God and we make right with Him. And we need a Savior. But here we see that the word confess in the, in the original is actually written in the present tense. The present tense of confessing now. So it's not thinking about that confession that you made when you became a Christian. He's talking here, John is talking more in an ongoing sense of the word here. And not in just in the past tense, but in the always present uh, tense. Uh, so it is an, an ongoing activity. It is maintaining a right relationship with God and a right attitude towards Him. So John isn't necessarily speaking here about the sinner's prayer that we, that we are very familiar with, that, that comes at conversion, uh, that justifies us in the sight of God as we accept Christ as our, as our Savior. This is a current activity of being sanctified, an ongoing sanctification that takes place, an ongoing process as a means of God's grace to return to the Lord, to go from wandering away to returning to the rightful stand with God when we have strayed away. To restore us into a right standing with God. You see, confession here as well, we must notice, is, is when Jonathan has it in mind, to God. You know, in elsewhere we are told to confess our sins to one another, and there is a time for that. But John in particular, because he's talking about innocent, our internal heart issue, He's talking about confession to God Himself. Because we're still looking at that inner private sin nature of ourselves, we're not talking about public sins here uh, that would require a public response, a public confession, We're going to somebody and saying, I'm sorry for what I did. Yeah, it's more about who we are that John is talking about and addressing here. Not the outward sin. So he's talking about confessions to God. To say the same as, 
or to be in agreement with. It's to be in agreement with God. In the context of 1 John, it is to believe and to say the same thing about our sin and ourselves as what the Bible is, what God is saying about our sin and about ourselves. It's acknowledging, Lord, I am a sinner. As your word says, I am agreeing with what your word says, what your word reveals about me. So confession is a right attitude. I think one of the classic confessions that we see in the Bible is, of course, David, after his incident of, of call it moral collapse. His moral collapse with Bathsheba and all that transpired around that. We read in Psalm 51 that the inner turmoil that David went through as he confessed his sins to God, as he made right with God, he recognizes that he was sinful at birth. You ever notice that in Psalm 51? He says, that surely I was sinful at birth. So again, he's speaking not about the things he's done, because let's face it, at birth you're probably the most innocent that you will ever be. Thereafter, it just goes downhill. Thereafter, they just the accumulated count of, of wrongs. But at birth, at that moment of greatest innocence, when that child has, in a sense, done nothing wrong, already then there is are sinful by nature. That child, although they have done nothing yet, has all the propensity, all the ability to be able to sin as soon as they get old enough to do so and know that this is true in our own lives. He also tells us, David, in Psalm 51, that God requires a broken and contrite heart. We just sang about that. And David asks, create in me a pure heart and renew a right spirit within me. He also just sang that song as well. And so, David, this is confession. This is an example of confession that we can see. The David recognizes his sinful nature. He knows what he's done with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. We know everything has happened. But David doesn't just mention that as the problem, that if I didn't do that, then I would be okay. He says, surely at birth, Right at the very beginning, I was sinful. And then he confesses his sin in that, and then he asks that God will do the restorative work through the, and with his brokenness, with his humility, he comes before God. Now many criminals will plead no matter how the evidence is stacked against them, no matter how guilty they might be and how guilty they might look, they will claim their innocence in court, they will deny the facts, they will try to distort the truth. But once they've found guilty, many of them, once they've been found guilty of what they've done, many of them will try and show remorse, or try and show some, uh, uh, you know, some sorrow for what they've done uh, to try and lessen their sentence. They think that if they did that, but yes, I did this, and then they work with the police, and that somehow they, 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 it will stand in their favor. And they'll be able to get a lesser sentence. But the reality is it's too late then. They've already been found guilty uh, and the verdict has already been passed. It's a sentence that is waiting, waiting. You see, confession or confessing is a, is a type of humble prayer. That's what it is. It is a prayer to God that says, I am a sinner in need of your perfect salvation. It's recognizing that now and always I am a sinner in need of your grace. The guilt is there. God sees it already, and we must too. Acknowledging that it doesn't give sin, acknowledging sin doesn't give sin credence in our lives. It doesn't give us, it gives sin power over you. Rather, it diminishes it and undermines its hold on your life and off to himself in a right relationship with and it's having this proper understanding about ourselves. Understanding ourselves like this goes hand in hand with a proper understanding about God. And John moves on to that where he says, and as he speaks about God who is faithful and just. It's important that he mentions that because if God were not faithful and just, we could not confess our sins. We'd be too fearful to do so. What would God do with us? If we confess our sins to him, if he were not faithful and if he were not just. You see, God, if he were not faithful and just, would be unreliable. 
You couldn't trust him. God would be uh, cruel. It would be, uh, it would be a dangerous thing to acknowledge our sin. What would the outcome of our confession be? It would be something very unpredictable if God were not faithful. But because he is faithful, and because he is just, he is a stable God. He is a good God, and we can safely fall into his hands. Even as David said, what, you know, what is the outcome of your sin? Would you rather uh, 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 be chased by your enemies? And he says, no, I'd rather fall into the hands of God. And so we can safely fall into the hands of God, our loving Heavenly Father. Because he is faithful in the sense of being covenant-keeping God. He keeps His covenant promises. He is a God who is faithful and therefore keeps His promises to what He has said. He is true to His word. And He has promised in the Old Testament to make a way to save us. In the New Testament, He shows us how He did that through His Son, Jesus Christ. He was faithful in sending His Son. And if not for His faithfulness to His loving promises, Justice would crush you, and you would have no hope. His faithfulness and forgiveness would mean nothing. What would he forgive us of if we were not a just God? He would not have no absolutes, but he is just. Guilt will not go unpunished, or he would be, not be a holy God. But God is a loving, faithful God, and he is just together. And as those two things are held together perfectly on the cross, through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness. The only basis of God forgiving us of our sin was made right on the cross. He never compromised His word on the cross. He fulfilled His word while He showed Himself to be loving and faithful. Because of who He is, that He is faithful, we are assured of complete forgiveness of sins and purification of all unrighteousness. Complete forgiveness of sins and purification of all unrighteousness. Now the idea of forgiveness of sin, sin is our debt. It carries the idea of, of a debt to God, a debt against God, whom, against whom we have sinned, uh, which He has paid by sending uh, His uh, Son to, to pay the price for us. He has brought us forgiveness of sins, paid the debt on our behalf. He's paid a debt that we could not afford to pay. This addresses the issue that we are justified. Just as if I had not sinned, that's what justified means. Our sins are not counted against us. It's no longer against our account. They are not ignored, but rather they are paid for in full. It's not corruption where it just gets somehow written off. It is Perfection in that it is paid in full. By Jesus' death, the penalty for our sins is paid in full, and we have the forgiveness of sins. This is essential if we have any hope of having a relationship with God. This is essential. And the second thing that we are told we get is the purification of all unrighteousness. So first, we get forgiveness of sins as we confess our sins, and second of all, purification of all unrighteousness. This unrighteousness carries the idea of a stain, of a, of a blemish, of, of something that is, that is dirty, that has been cleaned. A stain on a garment which is removed. As 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11 says, you were washed, you were sanctified. It is because God is faithful and this is necessary because God is true and just to his word and his ways and this Cleansing is imparted to us. It is received by faith in Jesus as we confess our sins to Him. Now verse 10 moves on from who we are as sinners by nature in need of salvation to what we do as sinners because we are fallen sinful, because of our fallen sinful natures. We sin because we are sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. So that if somehow if we were sinners because we sin, well then if we just could stop sinning, then we wouldn't be sinners anymore, right? Well, that's not what John has just told us. He told us that we are sinners by nature. The Bible, Bible proves to us that this is not so. Even if such a thing were possible, that we could just somehow 
stop sinning. So it shifts up. John shifts up a gear from our sinful natures to denying our sinful actions and the things that we do. For us to claim that we never sin, never do things that are wrong, would be a lie. It is effectually saying to God, you are a liar because your word says it is not true about me. What God has said about us, we're saying, we say we have not sinned, we're telling God, you are a liar. This is what John tells us. We are a liar, and therefore this truth is not in us. And we have rejected his word in a wholesale fashion. It is more than just a rejection of the Bible. The language is far stronger here as he speaks about his word not being in us. In the light of 1 John, he's saying Christ is not in us. The word is the word of God being Jesus here, and it relates to Jesus the person. Remember, Jesus is the word of life. Verses 1 verse, chapter 1, verse 1. And so we are actually rejecting Christ and showing that he is not in us. You see, my friends, we cannot pick and choose the parts of the Bible that we like. Or the the bits and pieces that we agree with in the Bible. We will believe these parts, but we reject those parts uh, because it doesn't agree with us, because we don't like what it says. Because inevitably, what we do is this, we, we tend to pick out the promises. We approach it like a, a buffet, sort of uh, a la carte restaurant, where we just, you know, you just go for the tasty bits, the bacon, and the, uh, you leave the broccoli, and you, you know, you go for the things that you, you like about the Bible. But we have to accept everything that the Bible says about us. We can't leave out the parts that we don't like. As a child of God, you eat what's put in front of you. You eat what's on the plates. Not, you don't have any pudding unless you eat your vegetables. And because you know that it's good for you, it's what we need, not just what we, what we want. True Christians believe the Word of God by faith. And even if we don't like some things that it might say about us, even what it might say about God. Sometimes we read things in the Bible and we don't like what it tells us about God. There's an aspect of God we, we don't, it doesn't sit well with us in our, with our modern ears. But we have to accept it as true because God's Word says it's so. The reason we're told about sin in the Word of God is so that we can overcome it. It's so that we can stop sinning. That we can recognize how, how deadly, how deeply it affects us negatively that we can recognize the seriousness of our sin in the eyes of God. And John writes so that we will sin no more. He says, I write to you so that you won't sin anymore. That we'll stop doing the things that are detrimental to ourselves and detrimental to ultimately our relationship with God. Of course, with others as well, but ultimately with God himself. Having pastoral concern here for them. He is not condemning them. He is he's saying, I'm writing to this, this uh, to you. He's referring to them as my dear children. He, he's lovingly reaching out to them. He wants to protect them from sin. But the reality that he recognizes here is that people are, as sinners, will do things that are sinful, that people will probably sin and do things, do things that we know are not right. And even in that eventuality, and I want to close with this idea, even in the eventuality when we have a fail-safe form, we have a fail-safe in the form of Jesus Christ, who is our advocate. John is not suggesting that if we cannot hold it together, that if somehow we, we lose our way and that we sin, well then we have an advocate in those cases as a like a last resort. No, he's saying we always have an advocate, even when we sin. When we do well, we need an advocate. When we do poorly, we have an advocate. We always have an advocate who is Jesus Christ, who stands in our defense. And what we must be careful of thinking is that, is of course, that because God is merciful and, and we have a defender, that it is okay for us to sin. That it is okay for us to be okay with sin in some way or another. We must resist temptation and sins lure in every way because we belong to God. And this does not determine whether you will be saved or not, but if or when we fail in our efforts, we are not left hopeless. 
We are not left with that. We are not left crushed and without any hope that we might give up. Now, in a criminal court system, the, the accused person employs the services of an advocate. You need an advocate in a, in a criminal court who speaks to the judge on your behalf. You don't speak to the judge in such a situation. The court, uh, the, the, the judge, is spoken to by your advocates. The reason you need an advocate is because they know the law best. They understand the law. They know what can and cannot be said, what should or should not be said. They understand the proper protocols to follow. They understand, they understand the whole, all the processes that are at work here. And so they are best in a position, best able to defend you against the prosecutor, against your adversary, against your accuser, and to represent you properly before the judge. They are there to plead your case on your behalf and to make sure that you get proper justice and that your rights are protected. In the court setting, they are your friend. They are very close to you. They are the person you like to see and like to hear from. And in our case, we are told that we have the Son of God himself, the Son of the Judge, Jesus Christ is our defender. He is the righteous one, meaning that he is perfect. And he, he can approach a just and righteous God on our behalf because he is perfect. He is the atoning sacrifice and stands in our place to plead our case. For he himself has paid our debt. The Lord's Old Testament uh, requirements, a sacrifice for the atonement of sin. Now, not only is this in place for those who believe, as it says, for our sins, John is speaking to us as believers, for our sins, for, for us, but it is also available to all, it says, who will believe. The world, those who are not currently believers, those who are not currently Christians, for the sins of the whole world, he means this is not universal salvation for everybody, in the sense that everybody will be saved, and this verse is misinterpreted and used to misrepresent God's uh, salvation, God's forgiveness, that all will be saved. He has died for the sins of all the world. It's not the same as saying that all will be saved. It doesn't say that. But that it says it is an offer that for all the world to receive. Anyone, in other words, can receive the salvation. <coughs> And this is a very powerful missionary thrust uh, that should drive our mission endeavors, all our outreach activities, that there is this cure for sin. That there is a defender for the accused who will not condemn, but will stand in our place. Without a a, a, an advocate, we are condemned already. But with that advocate, we have a friend, we have a helper, we have one who can save the world. And for anyone who believes, they can be saved. Potentially, all the world could be saved. But in reality, not everyone could be saved because of the sufficiency of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Not all will be saved because they reject. Many, most, will reject their need for a Savior. They will deny their sin and therefore reject their need for a Savior as sinners. <coughs> And therefore reject Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Now you might do many good things, as I've said this morning, but that doesn't mitigate our need of the Savior. When you get a speeding fine, when a, maybe a traffic cop pulls you over on the side of the road, you don't say to the officer, you know, I gave a hiker a lift back there, and you know, I didn't stop at the red robot down the road. Uh, you know, I had my car service the other day. My car's license is up to date, as difficult as that might be these days. You don't go into all those the good things that you have done. You might say, but I didn't hurt anybody else because of what I did. You know, I was speeding, but at least I didn't knock somebody down. Those are all good things within themselves. But you were caught for speeding. That is the issue at hand. And you are guilty as charged. Many of you are looking at one another, and uh, I've seen on your fridges the speeding fines on the, on the fridge magnets on, the, on your fridge doors. Um, I confess I have a few of mine that I've had to deal with uh, these things. 
we know we are guilty as charged. We plead for mercy. We ask for mercy. But the fine still has to be paid. And so as we come to the Lord, thinking about this, the many good things that you've done, we do not deny that. The good person that you are, the loving parent you might be, the good husband or wife you might be, all the good things that the, 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 the parent, honoring child that you may be, those are all good things, fair and well. But we still need a Savior. We are still in need of God's saving grace. As Spurgeon said, make no pretensions before God, but lay bare your soul. Let him see it as it is, and then he will be faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's where we stand today. Do not try to defend yourself. You will simply make a mess of it. Do not try to deny your guilt. It is obvious before God who sees all things. The evidence is stacked high against us. All we can do is come to our Savior. Come to Jesus, confess our sins, and He is our defender, and He is willing to forgive us. If you're not a Christian today, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I implore you on Christ's behalf, make right with God today. Make right with Him today. Confess your sins and your need for a Savior, even here, right now, today. As a believer, any of you may have some point lost your way altogether. Maybe some of you right here today know that there is sin in your life that you need to confess to the Lord. Know that you come to a Savior who is fair, who is just, who is kind, who is merciful, and will forgive our sins if we will confess him to you. Don't deny it, don't hold back on it, rather come to Jesus today and receive for yourself the healing and the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has. All we will do will confess our sins. But let's bow our heads. Let's confess our sins before the Lord this morning. And let us ask for this forgiveness. <coughs> Lord, your word cuts deep this morning, Lord. Your word goes to the very heart of the issues that we face, Lord God. guilt is laid before you, Lord God. And Lord, this morning we do not want to try and deny it, deny who we are, but simply confess to you Lord, that we are sinners in need of your grace, in need of your mercy, in need of the forgiveness that you have secured for us on the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we have complete forgiveness and this assurance that comes to us today, Lord, of the hope that we have, and we rejoice in this knowledge, Lord. We, we celebrate this fact, the wonderful hope that is there for us, who will truly believe and confess their sins, place them before your throne of grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that we have, despite our sins, and despite our many failings, Lord God. Despite the inner toil and turmoil within us, Lord, and Lord, even the things that show themselves, it's more obvious, the things that we do, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you can forgive us because you are willing, because you are able, that you, and your word, you promise to forgive us. So, Lord, I pray today for anyone who is in a real struggle with the temptation in their life, Lord. Perhaps, Lord, they've even been overcome by that temptation and have allowed it, Lord, place in their life, Lord, one way or another. We confess these things individually to you as we think of them right now. We bring them before you, Lord. We ask you, God, that you would have mercy. And by your Spirit, Lord, you would enable us to overcome these things, to, to be released from these things that hold us, Lord, as we turn to you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for this and praise you for what you have done in each of us. We ask the Lord for your mercy now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask the worship team to come and close for us one more song this morning.
Let's uh, stand as we close up our, our services. Thank you.